Welcome everyone uh, present here and uh, those joining us on on YouTube to the uh, IMC's Institute uh, Colloquium. Uh, I'm just going to uh, call upon our director, Professor Ravindran, to introduce uh, our speaker for today. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, it is indeed uh, uh, okay. So we are here actually to celebrate, uh, you know, the the you know the honor that we got uh, through Sitabra, who recently got um, one of the prestigious awards in, uh, namely Professor P. C. Mohalana Bhavis National Award in Official Statistics 2021. It's given by Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation, Government of India. And it is, as I said, it's a, one of the prestigious awards. And you all should be proud of, uh, you know, having Chitabra with us, uh, who got this award. Let's uh, first clap uh, for uh, his achievement. Okay. And, uh, and this uh, gathering is to celebrate that important event uh, and uh, for Chitabra, who made IMSC proud. And also it uh, falls, um, in the year of uh, 75 years of independence and we are as you know we are celebrating that with uh, talks by eminent scientists and uh, Sita Price uh, one of them actually who is going to deliver for for not only receiving this award also for the 75 years of independence and uh, our institute is uh, having a series of lectures by eminent scientists and I'm happy to say that Sitabra falls into that and then he's going to speak about it actually. Okay, Sitabra is known to most of us, <laughs> okay, uh, since it is going to be telecast to uh, worldwide and I wanted to sort of introduce him, not to you, but to the rest of them. Dr. Sitabra, born in December 15, 1970, has several distinctions and honors to his credit. In fact, uh, far too many to be named, described individually. He did BSc and MSc from University of Calcutta, and then he obtained PhD in the area of nonlinear dynamics of uh, neural network models from ISA Kolkata in 2000, and then the supervision of uh, uh, Professor Paul. And then I went on, um, uh, went on, um, you know, continuing to do research, and I went for postdoc at um, Institute of uh, Indian Institute of Science, IIT Bangalore, and then he went to Cornell, New York City. After completing these two postdocs, he joined our institute in 2002, I think, where he's currently working as a professor, Professor H, in, you know, that is citizens, and, and his area of research is computational biology group. Sitavra has significantly contributed in the area of uh, big data analysis, which is one of the, you know, hot topic that every, you know, young uh, minds would like to actually, you know, uh, aspire for, uh, and he's working on one of the hottest topics, and quantitative finance, agent-based modeling, artificial intelligence, okay, to name few. And also that uh, he has contributed to big data analysis of empirical data in context of Indian financial markets, especially in the National Stock Exchange of India, urban traffic flow in major Indian cities, demographies and economic development in several Indian states and epidemiology. Dr. Sina has been involved in modeling and analysis of large number of phenomena encountered in biological, social, and technological context. So he has wide interest, as you can see, applying physics and statistics in uh, many different areas. In the context of financial markets, Sitavra was, was the first to produce comprehensive empirical evidence that the statistical signature of price and index fluctuations in Indian financial markets that exhibit heavy tails characterized by the power law exponent demonstrating the validity of so-called inverse cubic law for emerging markets. He also showed that correlation price fluctuations for equities in Indian markets, and they are, are fundamentally different from the from that of the developed markets. In the context of urban traffic flow, Dr. Sina has analyzed large volumes of GPS data and vehicular movement using 
innovative statistical techniques. The analysis of variation of the traffic flow patterns over the course of an entire day or over the different days of the week has suggested several measures to design rules of minimizing congestion. Very useful for uh, such you know, big cities. The statistical analysis has been coupled with agent-based modeling of traffic dynamics to understand the efficacy of different strategies controlling vehicular movement of major traffic intersections in cities. As you can see, there are very interesting areas that uh, we'll be listening from him today. In the context of socioeconomic data analysis, he worked on empirical data from southern Indian states, showed that there exists significant correlation between demographic factors and other quantitative indicators. Uh, suggesting specific mean of infrastructure investment to development specific locations. In the context of uh, epidemiology, as you can see, you know, he has worked on different areas applying, you know, uh, statistical physics, um, which are actually down to earth, I would say, and very useful. Dr. Sina has developed statistical techniques to provide robust indicators of reproduction number of an epidemic. Very up for you know people you know the current situation with COVID. This has been applied to calculate basic reproduction number during 2009 influenza H1N1 pandemic outbreak in India to estimate potential burden of the disease in the country. More recently, which is you know one of the important contributions, Dr. Sina used to used it to analyze the trends in the spread of COVID-19 pandemic in India and showed subsequently the singular significant uh, slowing down in the spread of disease within a couple of weeks of national lockdown imposed in late March 2020. So I can actually now go on like this, but, but you know, we need uh, time for uh, Sitatra to talk about his work. Uh, so I'll stop here and I congratulate him again for achieving this prestigious award, making all of us proud. And I, am, I also wish him, you know, have, you know, in future, more such, bring, more, bring more such awards to IMSC. Thank you. Let's uh, welcome Sushadra to talk about his contributions uh, in the title, you know, playing games during a pandemic mathematical modeling for public health. I think, you know, we, we also have something to offer before uh, he gives the presentation. Uh, maybe two of you can actually. Uh, huh? and it, yeah, please, one of you can at least, you know, please come. I'll give this and sit up, please. Okay, so so shall we ask? Uh, okay, I request uh, Professor Chitapra Sina to deliver his lecture. Thank you so much. Um, it's kind of slightly embarrassing also uh, because we are not so used to you know having such a formal kind of pro, you know presentation in IMSC, but really appreciate all of you coming over here in such a bad weather, you know, despite that, you managed to come over here. So really appreciate it. All right, so um, I was uh, thinking of what to speak about for a public talk and thought that, you know, given that we are still in the midst of uh, a never ending pandemic, uh, maybe it would be more appropriate to talk about you know, what kind of um, contribution that modeling has been able to, you know, make in understanding epidemics, uh, if not specifically for the COVID pandemic. 
And in doing that, I will speak briefly about in the end about you know what kind of work that our group has been involved in. And in this, I will be specifically talking about you know applying the theory of games to try to understand why sometimes well-meaning attempts to contain and control epidemics don't quite have their intended consequences. So the work that I will describe was uh, essentially done by three, um, at that time, postdocs at the institutes, uh, brilliant each of them. So uh, Anupama Sharma, who is currently a faculty member at BITS COA, uh, Shakti Menon, who is a senior scientist, is still with us at the institute, and Sashi Devan, uh, who is currently a faculty member at the Cochin University of Science and Technology. So, um, those of us who have not been on another planet uh, would not need to be told this. Can we have the lights off, please? Uh, maybe it's, um, it would be much clearer if. The lights are off. Yeah. So um, you know, as of yesterday, uh, we have you know about uh, close to 259 million confirmed cases all over the world, with over five million deaths. And just to give you a sense of perspective, uh, so the world population currently is about eight billion. Okay. So presumably. We still have some way to go if we are to, you know, say that it will only die out once everybody who can be infected will be infected. But you know, one of the big questions is actually, do we need to, you know, wait for that long? I mean, is it that the epidemic would only run out of steam once it has infected all of whom can be infected? But that's one of the questions that actually modeling tries to address. Uh, when we come to India, well. Um, we have currently about, uh, you know, had 3.45 crore confirmed cases ever since it started. Uh, and unfortunately, we have had quite a f large number of deaths, you know, 4.67 in last counted. And of course, uh, there's a lot of question whether actually we're counting all the deaths which have happened, or this is a severe undercount or whatever. Uh, but without going into those controversies, the main question we're asking is, uh, you know, what can we do about it? Or what's the best way forward? What kind of policies can we put in place such that we can minimize the number of new infections, the number of deaths and so on? And in this, uh, you know, perspective, modeling does have a very important role to play. So, um, you know, to paraphrase uh, the famous Japanese martial artist, uh, you know, if you want to defeat your enemy, you got to know your enemy, right? So, so from that perspective, if you want to contain an epidemic, you need to first understand how it grows. So um, one of the things that, you know, I guess even those of uh, us who are kind of particularly mathematically challenged has understood by this time is that epidemic grows extremely fast. Okay. And essentially, it grows exponentially, at least in the initial phase. So uh, the, the simplest way to understand why this, has, this is the case, uh, you just think of a simple situation where every person who's infected with COVID passes the infection on to two others. Okay, so using then you know simple school arithmetic, one can work out that okay that if you start out with a single COVID case, that will result in two people who are infected. That two would give rise to four, four would give rise to eight, eight would give rise to sixteen, and very quickly you can see that it will grow to astronomically large numbers. Okay, so you know the world population would be somewhere over um, here, I think, and the current COVID number would be somewhere over here. So you can, you can see actually it doesn't take too much to get to extremely high numbers if you just have every infected person passing the infection on to two others. But of course, things are not that simple. And uh, this is, you know, some sense a bit of a more realistic way that the infection spreads. So, you know, like the index case or the primary person is infected may have, you know, passed it on to two others. But 
this person, you know, essentially got recovered before, you know, he or she passed it on to anyone else. And this person only passed it on to one other person. And so you say, okay, hold on. Uh, how would, in that case would it grow? Well, you know, sometimes you're not that lucky. So this person uh, passed on the infection to two others before he or she got infected or maybe unfortunately died. And then something happened. This person essentially passed it on to three others, which is, you know, more than this average of two that we're talking about. And so if we look at, you know, on average, how many others each person is passing the infection on to, essentially we're measuring the growth, right? You can see that it fluctuates, but on average, it could be around two. And so this is what results in that initial exponential growth phase. So would it continue indefinitely? Of course not, right? I mean, eventually everything would run out of steam because you are, you know, like a, like a fire which runs out of fuel, an epidemic to keep going needs its own fuel. That is people who have not been infected with the disease and are therefore susceptible to an infection. And if it just keeps growing exponentially, eventually, of course, it will run out of fresh bodies. Okay? People who are susceptible to the infection. So at that point, essentially, it will reach a saturation. And after that, it would start declining. And then you could either have the epidemic die out completely or it could become endemic. Okay, and, and that's of course one of those big debates that are going on in the you know COVID modeling community that you know are we going to see the end as you know COVID becoming endemic in the population or you know is it possible that it's going to completely die out or what? Now this growth rate actually brings us to one of the most talked about numbers in epidemiology. Okay, and, and this is something now even lay people have, you know, become very familiar with given that the media is all the time talking about this number. That's the basic reproduction number or R0. Okay? So what is this R0? In a sense, it's just a measure of how quickly an epidemic is spreading. Okay? So what is it in reality? It's essentially just a count of on average how many other people get infected by one infected person? So um, if you look at different kinds of uh, you know, infectious diseases, we find that actually they differ a lot in terms of how contagious the disease is as measured by this R0. So for example, hepatitis uh, C has a reproduction number of two, uh, HIV has four, uh, SARS has 4, mumps has 10, measles has an insanely high R0 of 18. Um, now you'll notice that uh, you know I've mentioned the disease in bold font here, Ebola, and it only has a reproduction number of about 2. Now compared to measles which has 18, this would be you know extremely low. Now and if you wonder okay why is it that every time a West African country like Sierra Leone has a few Ebola cases, the World Health Organization goes in a tizzy, they start sending emergency teams and starts to, you know, like completely isolate all the villages in which Ebola cases have occurred. Why is it that Ebola, you know, generates such serious responses when its reproduction number apparently is very low compared to something like measles? I mean, measles outbreaks don't, you know, garner such attention. Well, it's partly to do with the fact that apart from contagiousness, there is another very important uh, property of an infection disease, which is how likely is someone to die from the disease if he or she contracts that disease. So just because a disease is, you know, extremely contagious doesn't necessarily mean that it's also deadly. These are two very separate things. And so it turns out that Ebola, while it may not be very contagious, is extremely deadly. If someone contracts Ebola, uh, the chances of that person recovering is as low as 20%. Okay? So, so essentially you have 80% probability of dying if you get Ebola. Uh, compare that with, you know, like the uh, probability of a person dying from uh, COVID-19. So if you, if you just make a very simple uh, 
you know, back of the envelope cal calculation of, you know, how many people actually contracted COVID worldwide to how many people died and you'd get, you know, something like, more like 2%. Okay, so the probability of death is 2%. Of course, anybody dying is bad, but you'd say, you know, from the relative risk of things, catching Ebola is almost a certain death sentence compared to, let's say, COVID. And so uh, you would, for example, like to categorize the seriousness of diseases in terms of uh, how contagious they, they are, but at the same time, that's not the whole story. Now, a very important point to note is that there is a critical number or a threshold for the basic production number. If the basic production number is less than one, so that means on average, you are, once you are infected, you are passing the infection on to, on average, less than one person, not very surprisingly, the disease is going to die out, right? So you know, imagine you have got a reproduction number of 0.9. So that means you know today you have uh, let's say 100 people infected, and those 100 people are going to pass the infection on to a mean of about 90 people. Those 90 are going to pass the infection on to 81, and so you can see that over time the number infected with COVID is going to gradually decline. So if R naught is less than one, it does not result in epidemic where epidemic by definition is a phenomenon where the number of infected people is going to keep increasing over time. And um, much of modeling is actually engaged with trying to understand what are the factors which result in a particular outbreak of an infectious disease having an R0 greater than 1 because that 1 is basically that critical threshold. If you have an R0 greater than 1, you will have a spread of the infection. If you have it less than one, the infection essentially is going to die out. And how greater it is than one essentially tells you how fast it will spread. So the aim of public health policy is ideally to ensure that R0 would be less than one for any infectious disease outbreak. But if they can't guarantee that, at least try to make R0 as low as possible. If you make it very low, it means that it will grow very slowly and so therefore you have time to bring in public health resources to try to contain the epidemic. Right. At this point you might say, okay, so suppose we know R0, big deal, I mean, what does it give us? I mean, how does it help, let's say, a public health uh, policy design? And for this, essentially, we need modeling. Okay. Modeling allows us to make sense of these numbers and to translate that into meaningful policy decisions. So for example, using modeling, uh, the epidemiological community has managed to figure out that the important factors that dictate what is the value of R0 are essentially the following. One is, what is the generation time of the disease? Okay. So, what's the time interval between what, someone like me getting infected and the person I'm going to pass the infection on to getting infected? What is this period between the, the original infection and the infection that subsequently results from contagion? Okay. If this time is very long, presumably the spreading process is going to take longer and corresponding the R0 is also going to become lower. Okay. What is the average number of contacts with infectious individuals? Okay, not surprisingly, this is related to typically how many other people do I come in contact with? Okay, so if I if I'm a very popular person, I you know meet a lot of people on a day-to-day -day basis, then once I get infected with COVID, it's very likely that a lot of other people are going to be infected. But if I'm a loner, you know, typically I would not meet you know more than one or two people on my daily activities, uh, the chances that I'll be, you know, able to pass the infection on to many people is pretty low, okay? Number three, what's the probability that a contact between an infectious person and a susceptible person would result in the contagion jumping from one individual to the other, okay? So just because, you know, you and I have a conversation doesn't necessarily always mean that you would catch the disease, right? So some diseases are far easier to pass on to others 
than other diseases. So this probability is also very important in deciding how contagious the disease is. And finally, what's the number of people in the population who are actually contagious? Uh, sorry, who are susceptible, excuse me. Okay. Now you might say, okay, uh, hmm, so, so what? You know? So it turns out that knowing, uh, sorry, uh, that knowing these different factors which modulate R0, which decide what will be the value of R0, actually helps me to design specific interventions. So for example, if you are focusing on rapid detection of infected individuals and isolating them, essentially what you're doing is you're targeting one. You're trying to make this generation time very long. Okay? Essentially, you know, ideally we would like to make it infinite. Like, you know, the time between one person getting infected, next person getting infected, if I can make it extremely long, okay, by, let's say, isolating individuals and not allowing them to talk to others, you know, quarantining them or whatever, I can essentially make R0 extremely low. If I'm implementing physical distancing and, let's say, not allowing people especially infected people to meet with others, I'm targeting the second factor, which is the average number of contacts you are having with infectious individuals. How do you reduce the probability that, uh, you know, the pathogen will jump from one individual to another? That's by, you know, stressing on public hygiene, like washing of hands, wearing of masks. And sometimes there's also weather factors. So for example, if there's high humidity in the air, and if the pathogen is spreading by aerosols, at high humidity, they might actually drop faster through the ground. Okay? And so there will be less likelihood of you breathing in contaminated aerosol particles. So that is targeting the third factor. And finally, if you can reduce the number of people in the population who are actually susceptible, and how do you do that? Essentially, if a vaccine is available, you vaccinate them. So vaccination is essentially a trick of making a person resistant to a disease without having the person to actually go through the painful process of being actually infected. So vaccination allows a person to directly go from a susceptible to someone who's resistant to the infection. And so vaccination is essentially targeting this fourth factor. So depending upon you know, your resources, whether a vaccine is available, uh, the, you know, practicality of some of these measures, you can try any or all of these measures to try to reduce R0. Okay? And which of these have, would have how much effect is something that you can actually figure out a priori without before you actually implement them using accurate models. So modeling is of course extremely important as we now realize in understanding epidemics. And how did it get its start? I mean, when did, when did it all begin? Well, it turns out, surprisingly, the first person to use modeling to understand epidemics and with an aim to actually design public health policy was not a mathematician, was not a physical scientist, was actually a doctor. Ronald Ross, the person who won the second ever Nobel Prize in Physiology for his work establishing that mosquitoes are what causes malaria to spread from one individual to another. And arguably, you know, we can think of this as the first ever Nobel Prize from India because uh, Ross's pioneering work was actually completely done in India, first in Secunderabad and then in Calcutta. In fact, if you go to the PG hospital in Calcutta on the boundary wall, you would actually see still a memorial arch where it's mentioned that in a lab which is of course now demolished, not very far from that urge, Ronald Ross established the full life cycle of malaria, how exactly the parasite goes from human to mosquito to human. And uh, if you are kind of, uh, you know, interested to learn further, there's a very interesting novel uh, written by Amitabh Ghosh called The Calcutta Chromosome, which is about this whole story, of course, where, you know, he has taken fictional liberties, where uh, Ronald Ross himself is a character in that novel. So, uh, given that, you know, he won the Nobel Prize in 1902, you think that, you know, he 
you know, got uh, enormous recognition, he has done his work, so you think he'll retire on, and rest on his laurels. Not quite so, you know, Ross was a man, you know, with a mission, clear mission, which was to eliminate malaria completely from the world. So what I did was that uh, following his, uh, you know, Nobel Prize winning work, following his receipt of his Nobel Prize, he became a well-known authority on malaria and he started proselytizing that the way to control malaria is to eliminate the main carrier, which is to control the mosquito population. Now, he kind of encountered a lot of resistance to this because the popular wisdom at that point of time was uh, the only way to, you know, control malaria would be to eliminate all mosquitoes. And since, you know, completely extinguishing the mosquito population all over the world is impossible, why even try? You know, this is, this is the pipe, pipe dream and, you know, there's no point in trying anything. And uh, sometimes, of course, the arguments went even weirder. Like, for example, there was this army officer who told Ronald Ross that mosquitoes have been put in the world by God for a reason and you know it's like the you know kind of blasphemy to you know even imagine trying to control mosquito populations. So Ross tried of course initially convincing people by carrying out controlled experiments. So Sierra Leone which at that time was a British colony its capital Freetown was known as the white man's grave because uh, it, it, with a very high probability, people, you know, colonists going there would be infected with malaria and the death threat was of course horrendous. Of course, in the native population was even more affected, but you know, British colonists wouldn't care about what happened to the native population anyway. So they're more worried about what happened to the white colonists. So, so Ross was sent on a fact-finding mission to Sierra Leone in uh, 1899 and he kind of instituted a trial experiment where he said, try to get rid of all possible mosquito breeding places. So you fill in puddles, you prevent people from storing water in open containers, uh, you spray uh, oil on big water bodies. So essentially you try to eliminate all possible ways in which mosquito can breed. And it did bring down uh, enormously the number of new malaria cases. However, uh, in order to ensure success of this, it had to be done year in and year out. And of course, eventually at some point, the Freetown authorities decided that, you know, it wasn't simply worth the amount of money they were spending on this kind of, um, you know, uh, controlling mosquito breeding grounds where the money can be better spent on other things and so they stopped it. And so of course uh, Ross's first attempt at doing a control experiment you know was abruptly you know es essentially stopped and so he realized that maybe uh, he would have better chances if he can come up with a mathematical argument as to why controlling mosquito population even moderately would have an enormous impact on reducing the mosquito malaria incidence. So it turned out that Ross had uh, you know, a lot of interest in maths. He was an amateur mathematician and he started trying to you know, figure out is there a is there a kind of I mean, model was a too grand a term for it but he tried to you know, think of uh, possible argument to say why a reasonable reduction of mosquito population can actually help in reducing malaria incidence to a large extent. So his first arguments went something like this, very, very simple to even explain to school children. So he said, okay, let's imagine a place where there are about 40,000 mosquitoes. And let's imagine that only one in four mosquitoes bite a human. Okay, so we are talking about you know twelve thousand mosquitoes which bite humans. Okay, now let's say that you know you have a village of thousand, and only one human in this village of thousand is actually infected with malaria. Okay, and so out of this twelve thousand, only twelve are going to bite an infected human. Okay, now 
remember, uh, okay, and another point is that only one in every three mosquitoes then survive to become infectious. Okay, because uh, you know, malaria is a, essentially a parasite and it has to be in your bloodstream for a sufficient amount of time before the mosquito can actually pass on the infection to others. So out of this 12, only four mosquitoes would survive to be infectious. And now remember that only one in four mosquitoes managed to bite a human. So out of this four, only one is going to bite a human. And so you can see that, you know, although you started with 40,000 mosquitoes, uh, you know, using these very simple arguments, you say that, okay, only one infected mosquito is going to bite a human. Okay. And so you don't actually need to eliminate the complete mosquito population to be able to bring down the malaria incidence to extremely low numbers where you can even think of breaking the chain of infection. Yeah. Now, of course, you might say, well, you know, isn't this almost a laughable kind of argument? I mean, it's all just back of the envelope calculation. Well, he started like this, but then with, um, uh, you know, help from a professional mathematician, uh, he actually made this, you know, far more formal. And the crucial insight that people derived from this mathematical argument was that if you can bring down the mosquito population below a critical density, you can actually control malaria. And so that, you know, control of the larval population of mosquitoes is actually a practical operation, something that should be tried out to control malaria. Now this opened up the possibility that one can actually use mathematical arguments to understand epidemics not just for malaria, which is a very specific type of, you know, uh, infectious disease, but for infectious disease in general. Okay? So, for example, if you have a disease different from, you know, what is special about malaria is that, you know, you have this intermediate organism or a vector, namely the mosquito, which transmits the disease from one person to another. But what about, you know, something like flu or for that matter COVID, which is directly transmitted? How would you actually understand how it is spread? So the most uh, common way of trying to understand how directly transmitted diseases spread from person to person uh, fall under a very general category known as a compartmental model of epidemic. Uh, in a sense, it's basically trying to divide a population into several compartments. The most basic model assumes just three fundamental compartments susceptible, so people who can be infected with the disease, infected or infectious, who have currently have the disease and can pass the infection on to others, and recovered or removed, so people who have had the disease and have either recovered and so therefore are resistant to new infection, or maybe have died and again, you know, are unable to pass the infection on to others. And so the idea is that as an infectious disease proceeds to the population, more and more susceptible people are going to come in contact with infected people and with a rate beta are going to get infected. Okay? So susceptible individuals essentially transfer to the infected category. So they go from this compartment to this compartment. Infected individuals in their turn with a rate gamma would recover and go into this recovered category R. So over time, more and more people are going to go from S to I and from I to R. And eventually the infection, uh, the, the pathogen is going to be unable to find enough susceptible individuals to, you know, sustain the spread of the infection and the epidemic is going to die out. So um, let, let's see, you know, how it works in a much more detailed setting. So suppose you have, you know, some individuals who are in a susceptible pool, some individuals who are in an infected pool, and some individuals who are, you know, in the recovered pool. So initially, let's say this is going to be zero, uh, and this is going to be, let's say, very few people over there. So bulk of the population would be in this susceptible category. Now, the important factors which actually control how the epidemic is going to play out are given by the probability that when a susceptible individual meets an infected individual, the infected individual is going to pass the infection on to the susceptible individual. So that's this quantity beta. 
the number of infected neighbors that typically you'll encounter k inf and the average infectious period so these are the main you know quantities that we try to estimate once we are given some empirical data once we have these quantities we can actually try to simulate the course of the epidemic so typically what happens is that a susceptible individual will meet with the infected individual and the inf you know that individual is now going to go over from the category of susceptible pool to the infected pool okay and this occurs with this probability which as you can see is a function of both the transmission probability as well as the number of infected neighbors so if you think that this looks complicated just think of this as follows so the way we are arguing is what's the probability that when i meet an infected person i'm going to get infected okay let's say beta okay what's the probability i will not get infected so one minus beta and so let's say i have you know k inf number of infected neighbors so let's say i meet each of them independently what's the probability that i will not get infected by any of them it's 1 minus beta times 1 minus beta times 1 minus beta k inf times so 1 minus beta to the power k inf is essentially the probability that even though i have in contact with so many infectious individuals i will not get infected and so what's the probability that i will get infected it's just 1 minus this quantity right so so the interesting point is that it doesn't you know, the the process does not care did you catch the infection from one person or two person or three person the only thing that matters is that you caught the infection right so the point that we are trying to make over here is that the probability that you catch the infection is one minus the probability that even though you had k inf number of infected neighbors you didn't catch the infection from anyone so using this probability i can now essentially simulate the transmission of the disease such that i can with this probability take a susceptible individual and move that person from a susceptible category to the infected category and now once an infected person recovers goes over from the infected category to the removed category with this rate 1 over tau i where tau i is the period for which the person is infected now there is one more process which you know you can bring in once you have a vaccine available which is the process of vaccination so in vaccination what happens is that you go directly from the susceptible pool to the removed pool without having to go through the painful process of the infection okay? so by having a vaccination which let's say occurs with certain probability pi you can actually directly move a susceptible person to the removed category thereby reducing the possibility of you know this uh, susceptible individuals further contributing to the epidemic now the compartmental models were essentially order existence to three to two people backendrick who was uh, essentially a protege of ronald ross and a brilliant chemist kermack who uh, actually got into mathematics because of a sad accident so there was this uh, chemical explosion in the lab in which kermack was working in which he lost his eyesight so um, after having lost his eyesight he realized that his career as a chemist was probably doomed but instead of giving up he started you know to get into mathematics so he had while he was recuperating in the hospital he had people read to him from books of mathematics and apparently that's how he started developing you know a kind of a knack for mathematics and he essentially helped mckendrick who was again a doctor not really a mathematician to actually work out the details of the first compartmental models which used a very simplifying assumption known as homogeneous mixing where you assume that people in a population are equally likely to infect everyone else okay? and using this idea they could actually reduce the model to essentially just three differential equations coupled to each other where s is the number of people who are in the susceptible pool i is the number of people who are in the infected pool and r is the number of people who are in the recovered pool so we can actually you know look at what exactly each of these equations were doing so this was basically just looking at how the susceptible population is changing over time and it's just proportional to the current susceptible population and the current infected population with the proportionality constant being just this probability with which uh, infected person passes on the infection to a susceptible population 
to a susceptible person. And so this just measures what is the decrease in the susceptible population because of new infections. The change in the infected population on the other hand is dependent on two factors. One is its growth through new infections, which is just basically, you know, the loss in the susceptible population is the gain in the infected population and the loss by recovery of sick individuals. So as sick people recover with this rate one, uh, one by tau, you are going to have people gradually exiting the infected population and populating the recovered population. And the recovered population is just the growth by recovery of the sick individuals. Okay. Now, even this very simple vanilla, clean vanilla kind of model can actually tell us a lot of things. So, for example, we can actually try to understand how, as we change the effective contact rate between individuals, gradually the peak in the infection is going to reduce. So, you know, we, we, we heard a lot about flattening the curve and so on. Essentially, even a simple SIR model can actually show how reducing the effective contact rate can actually flatten the curve. So, you know, the peak, uh, the, the you know, maximum number of people you have infected at the height of the epidemic, you can reduce it remarkably if you can bring down the effective contact rate even moderately. So this is one of those big insights that you get from even a simple model. An even more interesting point that you can actually get from here is that you can actually try to understand what are the conditions that are necessary for an epidemic to actually occur. So just because you have an infectious disease in a population doesn't necessarily mean that it will always give rise to an epidemic. Conditions have to be just right. So what are these conditions? Well, you can just look at, for example, uh, this equation for how the infected population grows over time, namely DIDT. So you have an epidemic if the infected population grows over time. So in other words, if this rate of change is positive. So what does this mean? If DIDT has to be greater than zero, that means the right hand side has to be greater than zero. In other words, beta times the susceptible population size times the infected population size must be greater than the infected population size divided by the average period of infectiousness. So this gives me a condition for the epidemic, namely the susceptible population size at the beginning of the epidemic has to be greater than the reciprocal of the product of the probability of the passage of pathogen from an infected individual to a susceptible individual times the average infectious period. Now you might say, okay, um, or interesting, so what? Well, at the initial stage of an epidemic, almost everyone is susceptible, right? So you can just put S equal to N, which is the total population. So this means that the epidemic will occur if the product of the total population times the probability of the passage of the pathogen from one individual to another times the average infectious period is greater than one. Now, notice where else you have seen this one as the threshold when we talked about R0, basic production number. So in other words, R0 is nothing but this product. Okay? So this is where, you know, that understanding that what controls R0 is basically the total pop population which is susceptible, the ease with which the pathogen goes from one individual to another, and the average generation time comes from. The fact that we can actually relate the R0 to the product of this thick quantity. So we can see that even the simple model of Kermak and McKendrick could actually give us this brilliant insight as to what actually controls the spread of an epidemic. And if you just extend it a bit more, you can actually get something further out. So suppose you have a vaccine available. So what does a vaccine do? A vaccine is taking a susceptible individual and directly making that person a recovered individual. Okay, so you're reducing the total susceptible pool. So now you can see that you can actually control an epidemic simply by reducing the effective N. Okay, so what was the condition for an epidemic? N times beta times tau greater than 1. What vaccine does is that it reduces this N. So if you can bring down n to a sufficiently low value n prime such that n prime times beta times tau is no longer greater than 1, you would have not even allowed the epidemic to start. Okay? So you are effectively containing an epidemic. Okay? And that's 
gives us an idea of what's the critical number of people we need to vaccinate to make sure that we don't have any further outbreaks. Okay. So, so this is a brilliant insight because this tells us that in order to eliminate a disease, we don't actually need to vaccinate 100% of the population. We only need to eliminate a critical number which is actually given by this fraction 1 minus 1 over R0. And that's another you know, important reason why we need to calculate R0 for any infectious disease. Because once we know R0, if a vaccine is available, we know what's the critical fraction we need to vaccinate. And so for the R0 of around 2, it means that if we can vaccinate 50% of the population, effectively would have prevented any outbreaks. Even if the infectious disease manages to enter the population, it would only have a very local contained spreading. Now, using this insight, the fact that you know we don't need to actually vaccinate all 100% to eliminate an uh, infectious disease forever, in the 1950s, this gave rise to this wonderful dream that maybe infectious diseases can be made a thing of the past. And in fact, that was made possible for at least one disease, smallpox. So it was eradicated essentially by using this principle that you need to essentially make sure that a critical fraction of the population is vaccinated and not, uh, you know, probably surprisingly, it manages to reach its goal, which is that in 1980, the WHO declared the world free of smallpox. Unfortunately, we have not been able to repeat the success story with any other infectious disease, although we have come very close with polio. This, to some extent, has to do with the fact that vaccination is what economists call a public good. Okay? So vaccination is not only good for you, it's also good for others who may not be vaccinated. Why? Well, if you have a lot of people vaccinated, even though there might be some individuals who are not vaccinated amongst you, they're protected, right? Because it will be very hard for the pathogen to find out the few people who are as yet susceptible by going through the screen of vaccinated individuals. And so immunity or vaccination gives rise to this concept called herd immunity, where the fact that you have a critical number of people who are resistant to the disease ensures that the few people who are still susceptible to the disease are kind of protected, screened, so-called, by the vaccinated individuals. Now, the very success of vaccination unfortunately led to its undoing in the sense that despite the fact that you know vaccination has been one of the biggest contributors of the a huge improvement in public health in the last century, you know, now we have essentially vaccines available for a large number of what used to be like potentially lethal diseases. Despite that, you know, we are seeing resurgences of vaccine preventable diseases. So for example, in 2019, the US, you know, the world's richest countries, and they don't have the excuse that, you know, they can't afford vaccines, had an enormously large measles outbreak. Okay. And this is not just true for the US, all over the world, vaccine preventable diseases are making a comeback. Okay. And so the question we ask is why? Okay. Why is it that even when uh, vaccination is, has clear benefits, we have essentially a situation where people are unwilling to take vaccines so that vaccine preventable diseases are making a comeback with the potential risk of undoing all this enormous you know, benefit that vaccines gave to the public health in the last century. So can we understand this using models? Okay. Now this, uh, as you might imagine, has two steps. One is of course we need to understand how diseases spread through contact and not just, we can't just use the idea of homogeneous mixing, we actually need to understand how social networks of which we are a part actually plays a very important role in spreading the disease from one person to another. Okay, so we are not all equally likely to spread infection to everyone else. The social network of which we are part of actually decides who is much more at risk than others. And secondly, how do individuals take decisions to get vaccinated 
or you know to get their children vaccinated and this is of course a harder problem because now the question becomes how do actually individuals take decisions now um, I spoke about Kermak and McKendrick's model and I said that how they essentially assume that everybody is equally likely to infect everyone else and this is the assumption of homogeneous mixing okay? but of course in reality you are far more likely to infect someone who is a co-worker or someone you know who is part of your family than some arbitrary person let's say in Nagpur okay? so we need to take account of the fact that each of us are part of a particular social network and this social network actually decides who are much more likely to be infected by us than others okay? and of course the study of network and the understanding of network has undergone somewhat of a revolution uh, you know since the beginning of this particular century and for the you know our purposes what we mean by network is any structure where you know we have components which are nodes which are connected by interactions these are these links or edges so that the entire system we call a network or a graph and from an infectious disease perspective each of these components are the individuals who could be either susceptible in infected or recovered the interactions are the physical contact which allows contagion transfer and the system is the population over which the epidemic is spreading now you might think okay uh, how could this give rise to behavior any different from what we have already seen with this SIR models of Kermak and McKendrick? So here I'm going to show you a simulation of an infection spreading through a village and, and so this is an actual social network taken from a Karnataka village whose data has been made available uh, through you know some uh, study uh, or by an NGO. So what uh, in collaboration with uh, Chandrasekhar uh, and uh, Jason, my uh, former students, we did was we simulated uh, an epidemic spreading through this village community and what we found was that the fact that the village network has the existence of many communities, you know, so we can see that there are clusters. So the clusters essentially mean that within these clusters individuals are far more likely to talk to each other than with members belonging to other clusters. So our social network tend to be full of these clusters or communities. We, we tend to talk far more to people in our own community than to other communities. This actually has a bearing on how infections is spread. So the fact that you have community structure in the social network means that a disease can actually stay around for extremely long times compared to let's say a population in which there were no such community structures. So actually networks do make a big difference. Diseases which otherwise would have you know just zoomed in through a population and just disappeared can actually hang around for indefinitely long times if there is a community structure. So Introducing a network structure is very important. Secondly, we need to understand how exactly indiv individuals decide whether to get themselves vaccinated or not based upon the information about the disease. And for this, we use a very well-known theory of how rational agents take decisions, namely the theory of games. So the theory of games, which uh, you know was invented circa 1950s by John von Neumann, uh, essentially uses the idea that you can try to understand strategic interaction between individuals, and these individuals could be you know anything. It could be organizations, nations, or it could be even computer programs. But you know, for our purpose, we'd essentially be talking about individual human beings. So each agent essentially receives a payoff or a benefit depending upon the action that he or she chooses to take about a particular something. But this payoff also depends upon the actions decided upon by other agents. Okay? So you decide to do something but you know whether you will get the benefit that you imagined out of that action would also depend upon what actions others took around you and you would not necessarily know what are actions other agents are doing before all of you have decided and so that you already got you know 
you're just as that, so to say. So given this uncertainty, agents are trying to maximize the benefit or maximize their payoff by choosing optimal strategies by taking into account what they think others might be doing given the same information. So um, the, the simplest, the, you know, like the bore atom of game theory is what is known as the two-person symmetric game where you just have two players, agent A and agent B, each of them has the possibility of two possible actions, action 1 and action 2. And based upon what agent A, agent A chooses and agent B chooses, they can have different payoffs. So if both chooses action 1, they both get a payoff of R. If both chooses action, if action 2, they get a payoff of P. And if one chooses action 1 and the other chooses action 2, one of them gets a payoff of S, the other gets a probability uh, uh, payoff of T. Okay. So based upon this payoff matrix, now each agent has to decide, okay, what action should I choose such that I will maximize my payoff even though I don't know what action the other agent is going to do. So looking at this payoff matrix, you are going to try to decide, okay, regardless of what the other person is doing, can I do something such that regardless of what that other person does, I will get a maximum benefit. Okay. So, you know, your strategy would be, you know, some kind of mix of this probability of doing action 1 and probability of doing action 2. So if you choose action 1 with probability P and choose action 2 with probability 1 minus P, you get what is known as a mixed strategy. On the other hand, if you just choose action 1 always, it's like a pure strategy. Or if you choose action 2 always, that's also a pure strategy. Now, it might seem very complicated, but uh, in the, in 1950, uh, there was a incredible, you know, insight now, you know, by one mathematician, uh, which actually resulted in a solution framework for solving these kinds of complicated decision problems. By the way, what's wrong with this picture? Absolutely right. So that's Russell Crowe in, uh, you know, in in that famous movie the real John Nash is this. By the way, the Times of India actually put on that picture of Russell Crowe when John Nash visited TIFR. Okay. So, um, so John Nash essentially came up with this uh, idea of, uh, you know, how do you actually figure out a strategy such that regardless of what others are going to do, you cannot do any worse by, you know, choosing some other strategy. So, so the idea of Nash equilibrium is that if you choose this strategy, no one else can do better than you by unilaterally deviating from this strategy. Okay. So uh, to uh, just give you an example, so there is one very famous example of a you know game which is which goes by the name of Prisoner's Dilemma. So this was originally framed by Flood and Drescher at Rand and the story behind this game goes like this. You know, two people have been caught under very suspicious circumstances by the police. But, you know, they suspect that they have committed a crime, but, you know, there's no smoking gun. So, uh, in typical Hindi film fashion, they put the two person in different cells and interrogate them. So, each person is told, look, if you confess, you go free. But if you don't confess and the other person confess, then you are in for it. Yeah. And uh, both, you know, individuals are given this choice and, you know, essentially they are faced with a payoff matrix like this. They know that if they cooperate, that is stay silent, then, um, you know, they are uh, probably, you know, uh, going to, you know, go out of jail after, you know, spending a few weeks because the police don't really have any you know, concrete evidence. On the other hand, if one person decides to squeal and the other person doesn't, the person who squeals immediately goes home free while the other person rots in jail for whatever, five or ten years. Okay. And if both people squeal, of course, the value of their individual testimonies kind of get diluted. So maybe they get a lesser sentence. Okay. So given the circumstances, what's the best action for them? So, you know, in, in, in not so graphic terms, 
uh, here let's say you are shown this payoff matrix where you are shown that look A has this choice of cooperator defect, B has a choice of cooperator defect and you know each of them have been told that look uh, if you defects that is you know if the other person decides to cooperate and you defect you get a payoff of T that's the temptation to defect so that's in some sense the highest payoff because you go off immediately if uh, both decides to cooperate they get a payoff of R so this is the reward for cooperation so this is also high but not as high as the temptation payoff if both decides to squeal that's the penalty for mutual defection which is you know less than the reward for cooperation and finally the suckers payoff if you decide to be the good guy but the other person squeals that's the worst possible payoff okay so um, yeah, usually if I had longer time I would have said okay how many of you think uh, action 1 is good how many think action 2 is good but since I'm out of time I'll just say that you know this has been uh, actually played by individuals so you know people have done this experiment with school children uh, with actual prison inmates and so on and consistently it's found that the only people who actually give the correct Nash strategy which is to always defect to be always the bad guy are economists and game theorists. Okay. So say something about uh, economists I guess but the point is that individuals, humans, uh, normal humans are actually far more cooperative than we give credit for. They are far more likely to be nicer to other people. So this is of course given rise to you know philosophical debates as to what exactly gives rise to cooperation in human societies where you know it might be, bene it might be you know like more Personally, beneficial for you not to be act such good guys. Okay. Now, um, there are other games like, for example, the so-called game of chicken. So this is basically takes its name from this, you know, trope in uh, 1960s Hollywood movies where you know, like James Dean like character. Well, James Dean was more 1950s. They would two kids would go into a car, each would drive at each other at high speed. The first person to swear will be a chicken and lose face. But of course, if both people drive at high speed and eventually collide, they risk the chance of significant damage. So this game has actually has been studied a lot in the context of, for example, mutually assured destruction during the Cold War. So, you know, like each of these uh, nations are kind of, you know, saying that, you know, if you do something to me, I will like, you know, demolish you with nuclear weapons. And essentially it's almost like, you know, they're holding guillotines for each other on their traps and, you know, if something happens, obviously the other person dies. So, so here, you know, each person is trying to, you know, play a game of chicken, but of course the, you know, the possibility that both will defect would result in a catastrophic payoff. So what we do is we actually map this idea that, uh, you know, agents are playing games to this you know, uh, effort to understand how people take decisions to vaccinate. So the players are of course the individuals, actions are to vaccinate or not, and the payoffs are essentially, a, you know, kind of a, a optimization of risk of infection and the cost of vaccination. So the cost of vaccination here is not just the monetary cost, it could also be the effort at going and getting yourself vaccinated. So everybody of us who has actually tried to go to a you know, get this public vaccine knows, you know, how much hoops we have to run through to get public vaccination, at least in the initial stages. So you might just say, yeah, it's too much effort. I, I won't get myself vaccinated. Or it could also be potential side effects. So you heard that, you know, like if you give your kid this particular vaccine, he or she may become autistic. So you say, okay, why bother when you know, others are anyway going to get this vaccine? You know, I'm just going to free ride on others' efforts. Right? So given this, you know, kind of weighing or balancing between risk of infection and cost of vaccination, you may choose not to vaccinate also sometimes, right? So what we do is we carry out two-step process whereby we first understand how this infection spreads over a network and how as the infection is spreading and every individual knows how many individuals around it or globally are suffering from a disease, they take some kind of a decision as to am I in sufficient risk of contracting the infection and how many individuals around me are already vaccinated and based on that am I very likely to get the infection and based upon that they take an informed decision. Now um, what we essentially focused on was how does the source of information about the infection plays a role in deciding what you will do. 
whether you will decide to vaccine it or not. And so we are essentially looking at something like a you know combination of local information and global information. So global information would mean you're just looking at, okay, overall in the entire population, what's the fraction were infected? Local information would mean among your network neighbors, how many are actually infected? So you can take to a judicious mix of this, or you might just you know, if alpha is zero, you might be only relying on entirely local information. Or if alpha equal to one, it might be mean that you're only relying on global information. And so what we're you know, doing is trying to study how this value of alpha makes a difference in the overall outcome of the total vaccination in the population. And you know, using this alpha and this information, we are you know, making each agent at every iteration take rational decisions. So again, we can do a simulation where you know we can look at this Karnataka village social network and we can try to see that you know if they're only relying on local information versus if they're relying on global information, how do the outcomes differ? So the colors over here is the blue stands for the susceptible, uh, red stands for the infected and recovered, and yellow stands for the vaccinated. Now notice that if you are relying purely on local information, you tend to have much fewer people who have who are colored red compared to if you're relying on entirely global information. Okay? Now that is indeed true across all the networks we studied. Typically we find that people relying on global information would tend to have a much worse outcome than communities which rely on local information. So for example here, uh, if you look at the total fraction of nodes infected, uh, in communities which rely on local information would have on average a much lower total infection compared to communities which depend on global information. Similarly, if you look at the fraction of nodes infected, uh, vaccinated, you find that you would achieve much higher rates of vaccination in communities which have which rely on local information. Now, that's initially might appear kind of surprising, but then you realize what global information is doing is that it kind of underplays the impact of the epidemic till it has made such significant inroads in the population that by the time you wake up and say, oh, I, I need to get vaccinated, I'm in tremendous risk, it's too late. So you might actually achieve high rates of vaccination, but it's too much too late. Local information, on the other hand, allows you to take a much more nuanced kind of you know judgment of what's the risk you are under in and you know I, we kind of try to uh, kind of like to compare it with this so-called kanban the japanese supply management chain where you just have enough stuff at the right time available to you so here you are just taking you know exactly the you know the proportional decision to exactly how much risk you are in because it's the local neighborhood which actually decides how much likely are you to be infected by the disease. So, you know, given that we are physicists, you know, not surprisingly, we kind of, you know, played around with, you know, how exactly this transition from low levels of infection to high level of infections change as we change the degree of information local to global. So as you go from purely relying on local information to purely relying on global information, we found that there is a discontinuous transition uh, at low alpha and continuous transition for high alpha as you change are not and this is of course you know enormous implications for how you design uh, strategies for low contagious diseases and high contagious diseases. Well I'm out of time so I will probably not go into details of this but the same framework you can also use to understand non-pharmaceutical interventions like for example impact of lockdown or you know ban on travel or ban on schools, you know, because COVID has been a wonderful natural experiment to understand the efficacy of this, you know, lockdowns. So, you know, like lockdowns, of course, has been, uh, you know, linked to, you know, tremendously decreasing, reducing the mortality and uh, incidence of the disease. So, for example, here is the actual, uh, you know, project trajectory of, you know, how the number of infected cases of India went and this is what the projection was based upon the initial spread of growth and so one could argue that you know maybe we were saved this you know enormously high uh, number of cases by that uh, you know kind of lockdown but at the same time we have had you know the uh, price to pay for it uh, you know essentially the economy has been uh, severely uh, damaged but more than that there is a personal cost of you know uh, non 
pharmaceutical interventions like you know apart from the fact that you're staying at home and probably not earning your livelihood there are also psychological debilities uh, you know associated with it and so there's a very high incentive not to comply with non pharmaceutical intervention especially when you know it tends to go on and on and on and so we can try to understand this again using you know a compliance decision model using the same kind of framework of game theory as i mentioned to you uh, so what we find is that while in the absence of any compliance, you would have, a, of course, an extremely high peak of the epidemic, which you know eventually peters out. If you have less than total compliance, you could actually end up in some situations with multiple peaks in the disease incidence. This is not very different from what has actually been seen in India. So this is like the estimated value of the effective reproduction number. So you can see that in the first wave, it was of course very high as is expected. And then uh, the last winter, for example, we were all afraid of uh, another wave, but fortunately it didn't happen. But uh, it was more than compensated by, you know, in March, April having a second wave. And then there was a third spike, well, whether you want to call it third wave or other, of course, it depends upon you, but you know, around late August, early September, you had you know another spike. So one could argue that you know, could these multiple waves be a consequence of partial compliance, the fact that we have less than total compliance. So to conclude, uh, essentially, you know, what I wanted to like, you know, give as a like a take-home message is that modeling helps us not only understanding how epidemics spread but also gives us clues about how we can measure the effectiveness of ways that we put in place to contain epidemics so for example it can help us understand uh, you know why even though vaccination and non pharmaceutical interventions benefits might be very apparent the fact that individuals have incentives to kind of free rides on the effects of others kind of sometimes defeats the policy decisions to, for example, put in place lockdowns or put in place vaccination strategies. So when individuals decide strategically whether to vaccinate themselves or not, based upon the risk perception, the optimal effect collectively, so to say, is, uh, you know, reaped when the source of disease prevalence is a global is a local one rather than a global one so you have higher vaccine coverage when individuals assess their risk based upon local information rather than global information so the policy implication for this would be that having people access giving people access to rapid local disease prevalence rather than just you know making them depend upon mass media coverage might give rise to better outcomes rather than you know just depending on mass media coverages and the other uh, you know point that we'd like to make is that less than complete adoption of non pharmaceutical interventions can actually have this unintended consequence of having multiple peaks of the epidemic so i'd like to end uh, uh, by you know thanking the people who are associated with this work anupama shakti and sashi uh, and uh, anupama actually found this uh, kind of a cartoon which brilliantly summarizes this entire thought process as to why understanding trying to understand strategic decision making process is so important I mean, essentially you know game theory might sound very forbidding but the essential argument that we're trying to study can be put forward by a eight-year-old essentially you know, here dennis is basically telling the mother that look if everybody takes a flu shot why do i bother yeah I I'm just going to free ride on others. All right. So thank you for your attention and uh, be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Chitakra, uh, for this uh, wonderful and illuminating talk. And I think uh, we have uh, time for a couple of questions. Of course, he's around, so you can meet anytime and uh, discuss with him on this. Hello. So you talk about herd immunity. Yeah. So we can calculate through R node value, right? One minus one by R node. But R node value keep changing. I mean, uh, when it started, it was something else. Now it is something else. So how can we get exact value of herd immunity? Okay. So first of all, R naught doesn't change. R naught is the basic production number, which is what we calculate at the start of an epidemic, where the majority of the population is actually susceptible. What keeps changing is the R, the effective reproduction number. 
okay so the effective reduction number is saying that you know as the epidemic progresses so that you have more and more people going over from susceptible to recovered category obviously the total pool that is available to the pathogen is going to change so obviously the rate at which it would start spreading is going to keep changing so if you think of this you know exponential curve that i showed right it had an exponential rise and then it saturated and fell so r is basically nothing but measuring the rate of growth and r obviously is going to also keep changing at some point of time become zero and then eventually is i'm oh, sorry going to become less than one and is going to eventually start declining so the measure for the vaccination that that we are trying to find so what's a critical fraction that we need to vaccinate is dependent upon r not okay so that's something that we measure at the beginning of an epidemic so that as i said is not what is changing r is just going to give you some idea about how the course or the trajectory of the epidemic is now changing okay so you know i i know that r not and r sound very similar but you know it's good to keep this distinct in in mind okay. i'm just wondering if somehow this waning immunity can can sort of waning immunity be incorporated into your uh, sar and other models and maybe the vaccines don't have the same effect one year down the line or yeah okay very very good question so so um, in fact uh, there is a very popular variant of the sir model which is known as the sirs model which precisely does that so uh, in sir is what the assumption is that once you go over to r it doesn't mean that you always remain in r so with some rate let's say alpha eventually you will go back into the s category that is a recovered person after some time would enter the susceptible pool now um, prior to covid for example this was for example uh, the case for this is like malaria right so, so you will have malaria but that does not mean that you have lifelong immunity to it or for that matter syphilis okay so a person who is infected with that disease would have you know immunity for a short period and then would lose lose the immunity okay? but typically for most of the diseases it, you know the lifelong immunity was something that you you know took for granted now covid presents us with a very interesting challenge where we see that you know um, for whatever reason because okay so there are multiple reasons why you could actually lose that immunity one could be just that you know the pathogen itself is evolving and so like in the case of flu for example we know that you know having a flu shot does not protect you in the next season because flu would have the flu uh, virus would have uh, mutated sufficiently such that it's going to evade your immune defenses right so one way that you know you could have the waning immunity is to just assume that the pathogen itself has changed and so therefore um, you know if you want to model that you could either do it by having a sirs model or you could just you know model it as a separate epidemic altogether but it could be also be that as in the case of syphilis for example that your immune system itself is losing the antibodies Okay, so the antibodies are decaying over time, and it's the same pathogen, but you no longer have the same, you know, protection against it as you had, let's say, when you had just recovered from the disease. And this is something that we do, you know, study using SIRS models. So, for example, uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, simulations that I showed in the Carnatic Village Network. So that was done with SIRS model, where we say that, you know, suppose you have diseases where over time you are actually losing immunity. how long do you have to wait before the you know you have a resurgence of the epidemic uh so why why these questions important so for example uh, in many cases people kind of try to understand that is there a critical population size to have a sustained uh you know uh, infection remaining in the population so what do i mean by that so you know if you have a very small population uh infection after it enters the population is going to spread very quickly and eventually it's going to die out before anyone else before anyone in the population has an opportunity to lose that immunity right and so that means you know if it's an island population that means it's kind of gone 
right? The only way you can have the infection uh, come back again is to have it reintroduced from outside. But if you have a sufficiently large population, what would happen is by the time the last person has been infected, the first person to be infected is just coming back into the susceptible category. And so you can actually complete a chain of infection where that last person can somehow accidentally give the infection to that first person who has been infected and the whole process is going to run again. So this in epidemiology is known as you know a critical community size or a critical population size. So people you know try to measure the critical population size and you know try to say that you know, what kind of communities would be at risk of having a sustained or a you know persistent infection wave like this. So what we were trying to show was that you know all of these calculations make an assumption of homogeneous mixing. But if you have a population which is kind of has this community network structure, they can actually make the epidemic sustain itself with even lower than critical community sizes. Okay? Because the infection actually stays around for much longer within a community before jumping to the next community. And essentially it's basically slowing down the passage of the population. Uh, epidemic through the population. So by the time it reaches the last community, the first community would have essentially come out into the susceptible population again, uh, susceptible category again. So, so you can actually, you know, keep the epidemic going for long periods. And, and that's the reason why community structure is so important in completely changing the out, outcome of, you know, various infectious diseases. Let's thank Tabra again Thanks. for... Uh...